And today we're going to see that only Jesus can deliver us from the grip of Satan, from the difficult trials of this life, and from powers that seem to overwhelm us. And so, turn in your Bible, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 8. And we're going to turn to Luke 8 and study this morning the Galilean ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26 tells us, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the spirits out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake. And there were choked. When we read about the Galilean ministry of Jesus Christ, most of the time we're focused on the eastern shores of Galilee, this Sea of Tiberias, this body of water through which the Jordan River flowed, was a central part of the life and ministry of Jesus in his early days of ministry. We know that Jesus ministered there in the home of Simon Peter's mother. Yes, Peter had a mother-in-law. And that was there at Capernaum. Jesus spoke at the synagogue at Capernaum. And it was there that many miracles were conducted. But on this day, Jesus goes to the other side. And it was there that he found a man plagued with such need and difficulty in his life. A man who was burdened. A man who was isolated socially. A man who needed deliverance that only Jesus could give. I love the stories that tell us about Jesus caring for every single part of society, for every person, not merely his dedicated disciples, but even people that were far away from him and were dedicated even to Satan himself. Here we see that the Lord Jesus Christ has power over the spirit world. Make no mistake about it, there is a spirit world today. There are many fallen angels and Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And we recognize that there are various different levels of power. Uh, demonic power exists. But Jesus has power over all of the powers uh, that are displayed upon this earth. He's got the whole world in his hand. He has the heart of the king in his hand. And he has defeated Satan at the cross of Calvary. Now, without a doubt, Satan was plaguing the man at Gadara. And so it was that a problem existed in his life. I'm not here to tell you that every problem we experience in our life is of satanic origin. But I will tell you that if you determine to live for God, Satan will fight you every single step of the way. This past week marked uh, the anniversary of Apollo 13, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13. Some of you may have studied Apollo 13 when you were in school, or maybe you saw some clips on the news this past week. The historic flight was dubbed a successful failure by flight director Gene Krantz, who insisted that failure is not an option. History tells us that at 7.07 p.m., April the 13th, 1970, an oxygen tank exploded and instantly changed the mission of the moon voyagers. Uh, astronaut Jack Swigert stated those famous words, Houston, we have a problem here. Mission Control did not understand what he was saying, and so again, Commander Jim Lovell gave the words, Houston, we have a problem. You see, in their time of desperation, they did not call Paris, they did not call Tokyo, 
they did not call Sydney or Hong Kong. Houston was the lifeline for the astronauts. And so they called Houston. I want to remind you as we begin this morning that Jesus is the lifeline for the Christian. And when we find ourselves in a difficult situation, we turn only to Jesus for our deliverance. Now, I want you to notice as we come to this passage in Luke chapter 8, the presence of the demonic power. The Bible tells us clearly in verse 26 that Jesus came to the country of the Gadarenes and that he went forth to the land and there met him a certain man of that city which had devils a long time. Now, we do not know how this man came into this particular condition. Perhaps he had tampered with the occult. Uh, perhaps he had heard about God or Jesus Christ, but had decided against faith in Christ. Uh, perhaps he had been involved in some type of narcotics or incessant immoral or behavior related to idolatry. We do not know what he had been worshiping, what tools Satan had used to keep him away from the gospel. But we know that he was under the strong influence of satanic power. And as we come to this passage, I believe we need to see it from a spiritual perspective. We need a spiritual diagnosis. Oftentimes, we see circumstances in this life and we fail to recognize that there's an overarching spiritual situation unfolding before us. You see, the Bible tells us in verse 27 that this man had many devils. Now, it seems that Hollywood today is intrigued by devils, and uh, there have been many movies in recent years entitled Lucifer, The Witch, uh, The Devil, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, The Exorcist. The titles go on. I would tell you this morning that this is an unhealthy appetite. I would tell you this morning that no Christian who desires to have a pure heart and passion for Jesus would feast on movies about devils, demons, or hell. These are not places uh, to be uh, pondered and thought about and mused upon by a believer. This man literally struggled with devils and demonic influence. He, because of that, disregarded his own personal dignity. You see, sin will always take you farther than you really intended to go. And Satan will always destroy you. And we read about this man in the Bible in verse 27. He had been under the influence of the devils for a long time. He had no house. He wore no clothing. He went around from tomb to tomb. Here was a man that was not thinking rightly. He was socially isolated. The Bible tells us that uh, he was living in a place where no one else would go, running around and oft times cutting himself. He was isolated. Now, I know some of you would say, well, I feel isolated lately. I mean, we're still in California on this uh, stay-at-home mandate, and uh, some of you are kind of getting frustrated, and, and I share in that at times. And uh, I don't like it when I hear uh, our authorities telling us that the church can get back to worshiping in phase three along with the, uh, you know, the animal uh, washers and uh, other uh, such type of, uh, of industries. That kind of language is frustrating to us as Christians. Uh, we realize that those without Christ don't put a real priority on, on the assembly. And so here we are sometimes feeling stuck at home and, and not able to get out and do things we want to do, especially worship the Lord. And that day is coming uh, as we go through this time of isolation. I heard about uh, one uh, news anchor who retweeted this past week. She said, how long is this social distancing supposed to last? My husband keeps trying to get into the house. Now, ladies, if you're taking it to that extent, you're probably taking it a little too far. Uh, we're definitely under a social distancing, and it's mandated to us. But this man, this, this man that is sometimes called the maniac of Gadara, he was distanced, not because of the mandate of government. He had the freedom, perhaps, to go right back into his hometown of Gadara. But Satan is a divider, and Satan had caused him to be distanced from the normal activities of life. And I have seen many under the influence of the occult, many who have dabbled in various forms of occult practice, Ouija boards and 
eight balls and uh, soothsayers and all different types of media involvement to the point that they are distracted, they are separated, they're not thinking in sync with mom and dad, they're not uh, a part of society, they, they are distracted and distanced by a satanic influence in their life. And that was the case of this man, living amongst the tombs. He harmed himself. The Bible says in Mark 5 and verse 5 that he cut himself with stones. And mark this down in your mind that we're getting a picture here of our modern society separated from God uh, in a situation of filth and, and disconnected and, and cutting. And we see this in society today. We deal with this in counseling. People that disregard their own body, which is uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit if we're saved and, and uh, something to be guarded as uh, belonging unto the Lord. And yet this man had no concept of the Lord. He did not belong to the Lord. He was outside of social norms. He was under the influence of many, many demons. And he was in great need of deliverance. And we live in a nation where people, whether they are in tetters and cutting themselves and, uh, and affixed on the ideas of the occult, or whether they wear business suits and think themselves to know more than God and that there is no God, there is a demonic oppression today from which only Jesus Christ can deliver men and women in this hour. And so we see the presence of demons. It was a real presence. Now, again, sometimes folks struggle with the idea that there is a wicked enemy of Jesus Christ and of the church. I heard of two six-year-olds who struggled with the idea of the existence of the devil. They didn't really know what to make of it. One of the boys said, to his friend, he said, ah, oh, he said, there isn't any devil. And his friend got a little bit upset. He said, well, there is too. The Bible says that there's a devil and demons. And uh, the first boy replied, oh, you know, that's not true. He said, it's just like Santa Claus. And look at this. He said, the devil will probably turn out to be your dad. And uh, I hope that's not the case, dads. I hope that uh, we're not ever going to hear that from our children. But the fact of the matter is that there is a devil who fights against God's people today. And while we cannot be possessed, the unsaved can be possessed by demonic influence. And so it is a spiritual diagnosis that we see here. And I believe that there is a satanic influence today that is present in our society as well. There was a demonic dilemma taking place. Verse 28 tells us uh, that when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of of God of the Most High. Now, I want you to notice a few things about this dilemma that this man has. You see, when he was confronted with the presence of Christ, he cried out. He acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God. So let's pause here to understand something theologically. You can know who Jesus is. That is to say, you can know that he is the virgin-born Son of God. But it is not enough to know who he is. We must turn from any influence, from any false trust, and we must put our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Always understand this. When people tell you that they're religious, that they are spiritual, sometimes a very naive Christian will go, oh, well, that's good. They're religious. They believe in God. They believe in Jesus. The Bible tells us the devils believe in God. The devils believe in Jesus. And this demonically influenced man cried out from him. The demons cried out. They knew who Jesus was. They didn't believe in him, but they knew who he was. We hear politicians today quote the Bible and taking passages out of context and saying that they know who God is or they believe in a God. But there's a great difference between knowing who Jesus is historically, and believing on him with all of your heart. And so the demons cry out. They knew who Jesus was. And, uh, and they know that he has great power. In fact, we see here in verse 28, the Bible says that they fell down before him, and they refer to him as being the one of the most high. You see, I believe these demons were fearful of the presence of Jesus Christ. Revelation 20 and 10 says, 
And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see, the demons knew who Jesus was. They confessed that he was the Son of God. And they knew that he had power. And they know that he has power. And that one day he will destroy them. James 2 and 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Someone might say, oh, I just felt goose pimples. And I just trembled when I was in that religious experience that I had. Please understand, the devils believe in God. The devils tremble when they think of the power of Jesus Christ. But none of that means that you are saved, born again, and on your way to heaven. And so we see that Jesus comes from Capernaum. He comes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, he's a loving God. And he comes to someone who is filthy physically and separated spiritually. And yet he has compassion on him. And I say to you this morning... It doesn't matter who you are or where you have been or what you have done. Jesus comes to you and he cares for you and he wants to deliver you this morning. Only Jesus can love with that kind of love. Well, notice not only the presence of the demons, but I want you to notice the proclamation of deliverance. Jesus comes to proclaim deliverance for the captive. Verse 29 tells us, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters. Now here we see the command of Jesus, that there had been a commandment given, and this is why the devils were so nervous. Jesus had commanded the devils to come out of the maniac of Gadara. This word command means to order or charge. Never forget, we serve a God who has more power than all the demonic influence in this world today. When Lucifer rebelled against God and said, I will ascend unto the Most High, I will be like unto the Most High God, 33% of all the angelic beings followed the fallen angel Lucifer. And they have power, and they wreak havoc in society today. But Jesus charges them. He has power over them. That's one of the reasons we pray in Jesus' name. It is a powerful name indeed. Jesus questions these demons in verse 30. Jesus says, what is thy name? And the name that is given is the name Legion. And the word Legion describes for us a great number of soldiers, thousands of Roman soldiers. In fact, a legion of soldiers was 6,826 soldiers. What this man is saying and what the demons are saying is we are many. There are thousands of evil influences upon this one man. And yet the Bible says in Matthew 26 and 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Again, Jesus has all power over all the fallen angels. And there are more uh, of the angels that are submissive to Jesus than those that are submissive to Satan. And so the command of Jesus held great sway. But notice the control of Satan in this. Satan is holding on. Satan is creating doubt in people's minds today about the existence of God, about the origin of man. The devil is a liar and the father of all lies. And the Bible tells us in verse 29 that this man was bound with chains and had been driven of the devil to the wilderness. How many times have we seen people under the grip of Satan how many times have we seen people that just, just reach for that next drink, that next syringe, that next illicit relationship? They're out of control. They're under perhaps an evil influence. And this man was under that influence. He could not find a way of recovery or deliverance. 2 Timothy 2 and 26 tells us, And they that may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Satan finds these that have rejected Christ, that are following after some other influence, and he brings them into captivity. And so I want you to notice the command of Jesus, come out of him, Jesus said. I want you to see Satan holding on. This man was bound. But notice thirdly, the conquest of Christ. Notice what he requests in verse 31, what these demons request. They say, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. 
This is strange to me. These devils knew that they were going to find their end with this man. Jesus had commanded. He had charged them. They request of Jesus that they not be thrown into the water. They request that they would be thrown into the nearby swine. What a strange portion of scripture. They besought out to the Lord. Uh, these unclean spirits ask to be put into an unclean animal. They did not want to be in the cleansing waters. They wanted to be in the unclean animal, the pigs that were nearby. And notice the authoritative response of Jesus in verse 33. And then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into a lake. Verse 34, and they that fed them saw what was done. They fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. You see, God takes these demonic spirits, cast them into these swine. They run ultimately back down into the water, illustrating that Jesus has power again over the spirit world. Matthew 25 and 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, for prepared for devil, the devil and his angels. Here we see that the ultimate Ultimate destruction of Satan and these fallen demons has already been prophesied. It is a lake of fire. And all of those who have rejected Christ will spend eternity in this lake of fire as well. And so we understand, uh, according to Mark's gospel, that there were some 2,000 pigs in that countryside area. And that those 2,000 pigs uh, received the spirits of these uh, demonic spirits, and then ran into the Sea of Galilee, all at the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know what you're fighting today. I don't know what temptation. I don't know what trial. I don't know what you need to throw out of your house today. It may be a Ouija board. It may be some black magic. It may be some movies that you've been watching. I'm going to tell you something right now. If Jesus convicts you to throw it in the garbage, get rid of it, and put your faith in Christ to save you, or follow him as your Lord, but he alone can deliver us from the grip and from the power of this wicked world in which we live. And so we see the presence of demons. We see the proclamation of deliverance. Jesus charges the evil powers to leave this man. But notice, if you would, finally, the peace of this maniac of Gadara, the peace of this redeemed man. God changed his life. I'm so glad that we serve a God who can change a life. He can change the life of an angry boss. He can change the life of a drug abuser. He can change the life of a skeptic, uh, an infidel, an atheist. No one is beyond the reach of our God. Notice what it tells us in verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man. So here come the people out of Gadara. They want to see what's happened. They come to Jesus. They see this man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Now notice, if you would, this man seated there with his sanity. He is in his right mind. He is of sound mind. Uh, one author quipped some years ago, if other planets are inhabited, then they must be using the earth for their insane asylum. Sometimes it seems like, you know, everyone's going crazy and people doing crazy things. But here was a man who had been crazy. He had been possessed. He had been running through the tombs. But now he is seated. He is peaceful. He is in his right mind. And that's what God wants for his people he wants them to know this peace. 2 Timothy 1 and 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is what Jesus does. He gives us this soundness of mind and this peace at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I've seen it happen thousands of times. I've been pastoring here in Lancaster now for 34 years. 
We've seen thousands of lives change. We've seen neglectful fathers under the grip of a bottle put the bottle down because Jesus was now in their heart. We've seen rebellious teenagers hardened who've come to Christ as Savior and with a softened heart follow the leadership of the Lord in their life. We've seen God take families that were separated and bring them back together. But it's only Jesus that can deliver us from the grip of pride, the grip of drugs or drink, the power of Satan, and bring us back together, seated at his feet, clothed and in our right minds, as was this maniac of Gadara, so-called, now no longer called the maniac, now in his right mind at the feet of Jesus not, not only do I see his sanity restored, but I see salvation was received. Notice in verse 36, the Bible says, They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Now, it's interesting to me, because when the man's friends came out, they, they saw his life totally changed. In verse 35, it tells us that they were afraid. Why is it that unsaved people, when they see someone get saved, and they, they clean up their lives, maybe uh, they, they you know, take care of their hair, they fix up a little bit outwardly, inwardly there's peace, they start going to church, they start witnessing, and people are afraid of that, like, whoa, you know, you know it, it's okay when you're taking drugs and cussing and, and uh, partying, that, yeah, that's, that, that makes me feel good about myself, that's okay, but when you get God, boy, that's scary, and we live in a world that thinks that believing in God is on the fringe, well, I'm going to tell you something, you're never more balanced. You're never more centered than when Jesus Christ is your Savior. So these people were afraid. But then they hear this news. And I want you to see that there in verse number 36. It says, they told them by what means he that was possessed of the devil was healed. In other words, they said, let us tell you how this happened. This happened because Jesus Christ delivered that man. And when someone comes to you and says... You know, you don't seem too stressed out about the social distancing here. You don't seem too stressed out about the imminent dangers. You don't seem too stressed out about life. The Bible says we need to be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asketh a reason of the hope that is within us. We need to be able to look to people and say, you know what? I don't need to stress out because I know there is a God who is in control. And I'm seated at the feet of Jesus in my right mind, trusting him through this time. And so... Uh, his salvation was because of Jesus Christ. And then notice finally how this man surrenders. Most of you that are listening to me today would perhaps say that you have been saved. But I want you to learn from a former addict, from a former demonic possessed man. Notice what it says here. This one that was addicted prior to Satan. Notice in verse 38, the Bible says, Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him, that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way, and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Oh, he says, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I, I want to go with you. Jesus says, No, I want you to go back to your family. I want you to go back to your neighborhood, and I want you to tell people what I've done for you. And friends, I want to tell you today, you say, Pastor Chapel, I don't think I can really witness. I don't feel like I'm really worthy. Let me tell you something. We're only worthy because of the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only by his gospel that we have a standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if God could take this maniac of Gadara and clean him and change him from the inside out and then use him to be a witness, God can use you this week. No excuses. God wants to use you and me to tell someone else about the delivering power of Jesus Christ. And so there was peace that passed all understanding. Oh, it reminds me of the woman at the well who said to her friends, Come and see a man who told me all things which I ever did. Is not this the Christ? You see, only Jesus could change the life of the woman at the well. Only Jesus could could touch this maniac and change his life. And only Jesus can change our lives. Only Jesus can heal our land. It's only Jesus that can truly make the difference. 
I wonder today if there isn't someone who's tuned into lbclive.tv and, and you need to be delivered today. You're living a life that is captive to sin, captive to worry, captive to anger. Oh, you're not cutting yourself. You're not living in the graveyard, but there may be some that have been too interested and influenced by the powerful demonic influences that exist in America. And it's time for you to turn to Christ, the only one who can set you free, the one who is the Son of God, the one who shed his blood on the cross, the one who rose up again on the third day. And it may be time for you to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've been addicted to the wrong things. And today I turn to you and you alone. And I ask you to come into my life and to be my Savior. And I want to speak to you very directly. If you're not sure that Jesus is your Savior, if you feel bound and fettered by the things of this world, I want to encourage you to turn to Christ and ask him to save you today. You can simply call out to him and say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sin, and be my Savior. Oh, if you'll call upon the Lord, confess to him with your mouth that you know that you're a sinner, that you believe that he died for your sin, and ask him to be your Savior. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you do that right now? Would you take a moment right now and just say that to the Lord? Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I believe that you're the Son of God, that you died for my sin. I want you to be my Savior. I'm trusting in you, in your work at Calvary, to be my salvation. I ask you to take me to heaven someday. Did you call on the Lord just now? If you did, I want you to take a moment right on the screen there and just text us and say, I accepted Christ. Or email us, or on other apps, there's even a place to press a button that says, I called out unto the Lord. I want to be delivered from the sin that has been present in my life. I ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior. If you've made that decision, please let me know. I want to send you some information that will help you. A, a Bible, a book for new believers in Christ. We'd love to hear from you today. But what about those of you who have already received Christ as Savior? Can I encourage you that God did not save you so that you would go back under the oppression of this world? Oh, sure, you cannot be uh, indwelt as the maniac of Gadara was, but you can be influenced. And God says, I want to be the influence in your life. I want you to go tell others what I've done for you. Christian friend, if you've been delivered, then let's share the news of deliverance this week with those all around us. Let's have that peace, like Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet, like this man from Gadara, who was sitting at the feet of Jesus, with peace. Oh, let the peace of God pass over you this week. No matter what's going on in this country, Jesus Christ, who delivered you from sin, will deliver us from this pandemic. He will have his way. May we trust him and May we know that he alone will give us the victory. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, you have promised great victory for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for those who have believed on Christ today. Help them, Lord, to text and respond today online so that we might encourage their faith. Help us as Christians to realize that if you could use the woman at the well, if you could use the man of Gadara, you can use us to publish the glad tidings of the gospel. Help us to be faithful in doing that even this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much.